which is where the problem begins. So we got what we believe is the results of every single election have been done this way. Has the election commission done this way? Now this is data going back to 1951. No electronic information. Forget no electronic voting. There are you know, even more bigger issues that people had during the 1951 elections. And we need to basically consider if even the parties existed at that time. Have they changed their names? Are the constituencies the same? There are several things like this. What tools do we have at our disposal to review data like this? Well, to be fair, the most important tool that we have are our eyes and our brains. Ultimately, we are going to spend a lot of time inspecting this manually, looking at it manually. Let me tell you one issue that we have with this. When you look at data, you're going to have this following simple problem. To illustrate that, I'm going to give you a small quiz. I'm going to show you a table of numbers, not too different from the kind that you see, and just 100 numbers, not millions of numbers like I have out here. And I'm going to ask you three simple questions to which you can answer in 30 seconds. Uh, each question, 10 seconds. You don't have to shout out the answer or say it out loud. Just remember it or write it down, whatever you want. It's really straightforward. Your time starts right now. How many are below 10? Say to your Which quarter has the highest total? This is the value we actually have to get this done easily. That was 30 seconds. Let's do a quick poll. How many numbers were above 100? 6, 6, 6. 5, 6, 7. Can you take us for 8? 6, 6. Can you take us for 4? So 4, 5, 6, or 7. Can you take us for 3? So somewhere between 3 and 7. Uh, how many numbers were below 10? 9. 9, 10. 7. So, it's slightly higher than the number of numbers that were uh, that were less than uh, over. Okay. Uh, and how which one has the highest total? Okay, I've seen every possible answer. So, <laughs> <laughs> let's do the same thing again, but this time with some basic highlighting. Okay. Extremely simple shading of colors. And let's see how long it takes with this one. Feel free to show the answer for an hour fix clearly. How many numbers are above one? How many are below 10? Which quarter has the highest total? Nine. Got the answer. It's not about the speed. First, we need to be only 12 seconds this time. And if you think that 10 seconds is too short a time to stare at the space of numbers, let me pause for 10 seconds to tell you how long it is. I'm just going to stay silent for 10 seconds.
increases visually, then your probability of speed of processing and accuracy of processing increases by a lot of Ultimately, remember, you are optimizing for humans, not for machines. And therefore, what happens when you're looking at data is that your load transforms from being that of a tester to, in some sense, being that of an, ana uh, of an analyst. Testing data is really not too different from analysis, except that while an analyst is looking for insights, you're looking for errors. You're looking for proof that something is wrong, rather than something is interesting. But the techniques that you use are almost identical. Now, which is an interesting thing from a company perspective. On the one hand, from a career perspective, testing data is a great thing because then you have the option of switching over to an analyst track and moving on to consult. On the other hand, it's also an interesting thing because there is constantly more data that's coming your way. The scope of testing code will grow only at a certain pace. The scope of testing data will grow at a much faster pace. Let me give you an example of how we were going about testing this election data. Where we have all of this data that's scraped and put together in the CSV file. Right? Um, the key question was, can we see anything weird in the pattern of data? And one of the things that we did was took every single constituency in one state and said, for each row, the cell, each row is one constituency, and I've hidden the names of the constituencies. Each column is one year where we've had elections, and the cell contains the number of contestants in each constituency. I've mildly highlighted a certain set of numbers. You notice here, for example, that there is one constituency here which had five candidates, three candidates, two candidates, three candidates, and suddenly seems to have vanished. But then there's another constituency which just takes off at that point, has a whole bunch of candidates, and then vanishes again, and then goes back here. Just strange. You have another constituency here which has only, which has had candidates only in two elections, and then suddenly it starts spurting up here. Another one here where it starts here and then goes up. It's like, here are a bunch of things that seem to be misaligned. Any guesses why this could be happening? Name change, possibly. Which is what we thought, right? except that we had access to the original data, and this is what we saw. Spinning mistakes. That is a bigger problem than name changes. A constituency is almost never spelled the same way. What you need are constituency numbers, now, which would be great if the, con if the election commission provided those. Unfortunately, the election commission does not provide these going back beyond 2004. It's only starting from 2004. So beyond that, you've got to start running. So is, in fact, b.t.m layout the same as b.t.m dot layout? Yeah, I don't think there's any confusion about that. Trouble is, there are several thousands of these constituencies. There are tens of thousands of constituencies if you count the spelling mistakes. How am I ever going to rationalize this data? So we know we have a problem with the data. And we can spot that relatively easily by, by a simple pattern of representation. Here's another example. In all of these cases, you can see that out here, we have uh, in the third and fourth rows, Alan, which is misspelled differently, but it starts with the same letter. This is misspelled, but starts with the same letter, starts with the same letter, starts with the same letter. Not every constituency is like that. In fact, there are more exceptions. And this is rarely the norm. Uh, in uh, Karnataka, for instance, Kundapura is also Kundapur, or was. Now, is this a name change or is this a spelling mistake? I'm not sure. I, I, I still don't know. Maybe it's a name change. Maybe like Mum Bombay decided to become Mumbai. This was Kundapur becoming, deciding to become Kundapura. But it's the same constituency. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and there are several other examples. So. Uh, in Andhra Pradesh, for example, the constituency of Bandar is actually the constituency of Machlipat. How did we figure that out? Through research, not through data. Kadapa is the same as Kadapa. This was figured out through data. We sort of know that it's roughly the same thing. And incidentally, this too was highlighted by data because we spotted that the pattern of Bandar is the same as the pattern, is a complement of the pattern of Machlipat. If you fit these, it just forms a straight line. So that's a candidate for secondary research, you start saying, okay, here's a bunch of these that seem to fit perfectly. So let me go back and check if they were, in fact, the same. Girala is the same as Chirala. Now, that's the case of a simple typing mistake. Somebody just typed G instead of C because they're close by, and nothing more than that. That just happened once. Daksing uh, Taliha. <clears throat> now, this, con this confusion between D and T, or in some cases, U and B, that sort of thing happens far too often, especially South Indian constituencies. People just have no clue of how to spell it. But it's not just spellings. Let's take other examples. Parties. M-A-D-N-K is the same as M-A-M-A-K is the same as M-D-N-K because I don't think the party particularly considers itself to have an official English uh, version. It's just 
Madhi Muka. Okay, fine. That's the Tamil version, but what do you translate it to? And every election commission official decides to translate it in a different way. Uh, the party names change. The All India Anna Dravid Munetrakarad AIADNK is the same as the ADNK, is the same as the ADK, just that in different elections they've had different abbreviations. And worse, in the same election, sometimes they've had different abbreviations in different constituencies. <coughs> Parties. The INCI, which is the Indra branch of the Congress, is actually the same as the Indian National Congress for all practical purposes. There was only one election where they branched off and contested, and the rest of the party pretty much branched back in. So they became the official party. So now out here, the data is not going to tell us anything. It's us who, who got to know that these are really the same parties. And spelling mistakes, as we've seen, can be in completely different ways. Badrachal can be spent with a, spelled with an A and E. A CH can be swapped to a HC. Are there tools that can help us spot these kinds of things? Fortunately, there are. And the, the number is growing. I'm going to show you one example of such a tool that can spot it. But before I get into the tool, let me talk about how these tools work. The principle is simple. If you were to go to Google and do a search for Badrachal with spelling number one and spelling number two, you get a different number of results. In one case, you get 14 lakh results. In the other case, you get 14,000 results. We make a simple assumption that more people spell it correctly than people who spell it wrong. And if you make that assumption, then spelling corrections become a very simple process. Go to Google, search for both spellings, see which ones have a higher number, and use that. Right. Now, you can make the same assumption. By the way, this assumption is not always valid. The reason is if you search for, let's say, visualization with an S and a Z, it will say that Z is correct, but we do follow British spelling here, right? So there are regional biases and so on. But I could apply this to the data set and ask the question, so is Badra Chalam with an A occurring more commonly or Badra Chalam with an E occurring more commonly? And whichever is the most common, I make the naive assumption that that's what is the correct data set and go with that. So automated correction has some basis, and in this case, data itself provides a way. Simply by looking at the most frequent one and assuming that the most frequent one is more likely to be right, you can correct a lot of data. But then comes the question of, that's fine. That's if I know that Badra Chalam with an A and an E are the ones that I need to compare. How do I even get to these groups of misspellings as being the uh, correct ones? Then, fortunately, there are tools for that. One such is Open Refine. Now, I'm going to show you how this uh, works, if I can get to it. Um, it's probably a bit small. Uh, I'll try and uh, make it a little larger once this stops working. Okay, okay. Let's remove this. Let's remove this. Okay. So I have on the right side a data set, and this has every single constituency, and within that, every single candidate's name, age, category, blah, blah, blah. Uh, let's take the state, and we'll create a facet for the state so that I can pick a given state. I'm going to start with Andhra Pradesh because it's the first one. Now that gives me 21,000 rows. That's still humanly non navigable But the question that I'm trying to answer is, can I take the assembly constituency name and having created a text facet out of it, let's see how many assembly constituencies there are. There are about 587 assembly constituencies. Now just visually looking at it, I can see that there are some spelling mistakes. Allagadda and Allagadda are likely to be the same one. Can we automatically cluster these? Short answer is yes, let's cluster it. And it says that, look, you may want to consider Guntur 1 and Guntur 2 as being somewhat similar. Uh, sorry, I'm going to re click on cluster again so that it fits. Yeah. Or second or bad contournement with a dot and without a dot are probably the same thing. There are a variety of algorithms that you can use. So I'm going to take one, say, metaphor, for example. Now it says, here are various misspellings of Vishakapatnam. Here are various misspellings of Guntur. Now, some of these are not really misspellings. Guntur 2 is actually a different constituency from Guntur 1. But Guntur-1 is arguably the same as Guntur-1. space And Guntur-i-i space I space I is probably the same as Guntur-i-i. space I I, right? Or let's take another at random. Um, <laughs> Chilakaluri pet is the same as Chilakaluri peta is the same as however as this has been misspelled. Now the question is what is the correct spelling and that's pretty easy to figure out as well because the first one is always the one that has the largest number of rows. So uh, Chilakaluri pet is 84 rows and there are three rows where it's been spelled in different ways. So yeah, misspellings. Now the good part is this tool offers a way of a one click fix all of this kind of a thing. So which means that I can go through this at, Know, reasonably quickly and start fixing these errors quite well. So out here, for example, Sulur Pet, Sulur Peta, Sulur Pet. Just put a tick mark against that and say merge all of these to the most common. 
and you can do that one after another, making life faster. And these kinds of tools are emerging fairly uh, at increasing frequency. You get to clean up data and test data much better than you used to a long time ago. The nature of these tools is also increasing in sophistication. So for example, one of the things that we were doing was looking at the board of directors of all of the Tata companies. This was not from a direct and perspective, I'll tell you why we were doing this later. Uh, and the question was, what is the relationship between the directors and the companies? Every circle here, uh, I'll show you the live visualization if I can get to it. Mm. Uh, director and orange circle is a director. Every blue circle is a company. And you can see that by and large, this whole thing has been split into two different groups. It's like there are a set of companies and they have their own directors. There are another set of companies and they have their own directors with a few directors in the middle in common. But it's almost like the group comfortably splits. And this is the old guard, the relatively older companies in the Tata group. Those are the relatively newer companies in the Tata group. The very senior directors, almost all without exception over 60, are in the middle that are common as directors across both of these. But otherwise, the group has two completely different set of sectors, which means that, say, 15 years down the line, when all of the old guard retires, the Tata group is probably going to have to completely destroy a set of directors and split them into two. Now, how can I, where does this come into testing? That's an interesting analytical insight, but how does one use this in testing? This is a network representation which we used quite extensively for a life insurance company. When they ask the question, can you tell us out of all of our dozens of customer databases, which customers are common and which ones are distinct? Or for another Indian national 